Welcome to the session about movement building, students, student movements and higher education values. My name is Beate Ergoy and I'm the president of SAI, the Norwegian Students Academic the Norwegian Students and Academics International Assistance Fund, and I'm very glad to be co-hosting this session today together with Scholars at Risk. And I think the topic for our presentation and discussion is quite broad because we know that students are very often in the forefront fighting for human rights and democracy. And they are active in voicing out their concerns for the provision of higher education and they do inspire also a broad, a broad public participation. And on numerous occasions we see that students are the ones who are in the forefront and demanding change. If they see that the development in their society is stagnating or if it's moving in the wrong direction, they are the ones who are voicing out the concerns. And I'm really glad uh, that today I have three prominent student activists with me here today to have some fruitful and constructive discussions. Um, I know we are a bit ahead of time because I want uh, different student activists to provide some brief presentations and then we'll move on to a moderated discussion and then we will open up for questions and comments from you in the audience. So please go ahead and think of some questions if there's anything that pops up along the way. Um, <coughs> all right, so let me just first introduce you to the three speakers and then they will all have a short presentation. So starting here, we have Tamires Gomez Sampaio. She is the former vice president of UNE, which is the national student movement in Brazil. And she is currently a law student, and she has also been active in an, in an initiative that is called the Global Student Voice, which is trying to unify national student movements from all over the world uh, to join them because we know that students are fighting for common issues, they have struggles in common, and also try to unify to fight together for solutions. And then we have Fasia Hassan. She is uh, one of the prominent student leaders who played an active role in the Feast Must Fall student protest in South Africa. She has held the position as a student representative, uh, council secretary, secretary general at Wits University, uh, and currently she is the Deputy Secretary General in South African Union of Students. And she is also a student of law. And uh, all the way to the right we have uh, Mustafa El Sayed. He is a human rights activist from Egypt. And he is currently studying in Norway in the University of Tromsø. Um, under the Student at Risk program which is offering protection and a continuation of higher education for student activists who are fighting for human rights and democracy. Mustafa was uh, active as a student activist during the Arab Spring and under the revolution in Egypt in 2011. And he also co-founded co a student union. So we'll hear more from them now. Let me just first give the word to Tamiris and then we'll move along. Good morning to everyone. Um, I would like to thank Seth for the opportunity to speak to all of you about students' movement of Brazil and about our struggles. Um, this passing four days here in this Congress has been very important to me because I've had the opportunity to share and to hear experience from activists and scholars from all over the world and here their history give me strength to go back to Brazil and face our situation there. I speak about students' movement and academic freedom. It's to talk about democracy and how the academy and activists fight to build an education system for all in their countries. And when it comes to Brazil, I can't talk about democracy and the 
education system without talking about racism. In 2018, we celebrate 130 years of the end of slavery in Brazil, and still today, we can see the reflexes of a racist society. We can see it in 2016, when we have a research that talked to us that in each 23 minutes in Brazil, in every day, a black young person die. We can see it because we are the country with the largest black population out of Africa, but we don't see black people in the academy, at the Congress, or in power positions. And we can see this also when Marielle Franco, that it's a black woman elected to the city council of Rio de Janeiro, was violated murder. So I want to start with this. Democracy is about participation is about representation, and academic freedom is also about freedom for black, indigenous, women, young, and LGBT people to do, to be who they are, and to contribute with the knowledge building that we do in the universities. I'm former vice president of the National Students' Union of Brazil, a law student, now I'm doing my master degree, and the students' movement in the past years in Brazil had to make a radical change in our struggles. Um, since 2003, with the Lula da Silva government as president, the education system had a lot of victories. We have expansion in higher education for cities in the interior of our country, Thousands of technical schools were created, scholarships, affirmative actions, quotas, exchange programs, scholarships for scholars, and actually access to education system was one of the federal government's priorities. But in 2016, our president elected Dilma Rousseff was victim of a parliamentary coup that resulted in her impeachment. And since then, the coup government has been whipping out historically concrete social rights in Brazil, freezing funding for education, and with a project called School Without a Party, has been truly promoting an ideological harant in the schools and university. Sensory schoolers and teacher through our country based on a conservative and fundamentalist ideal. In the last two years, our movement have, has moved from a scenario of many victories to a fight against social rights elimination and a, in a fight against the coup. In recent years, we have been occupying school and university, organizing debates with students, promoting demonstrations with social movements in defense of democracy in Brazil, and together with the social movement, organizing demonstrations for democracy. Uh, we fight with teachers and scholars in defense of public and free education for all, and against the censorship promoted by the Project School Without a Party. Our demonstrations were harshly repressed by the police. We had teachers and students who were arrested and hit by moral bombs and robot bullets. And this repression and persecution was increased in recent months in Brazil. Uh, as you can see in this image, uh, this is a, a student from secondary education. Uh, they are fighting because the government in Sao Paulo uh, tried to close some schools and then the secondary students occupy their schools and say, no, the school is mine, the education are mine. Uh, this is a photo of some demonstration in Brazil and some repression for the police. This is uh, this one. It's a teacher. They were fighting for funds for education in Sao Paulo, and they were harshly repressed by the police. And this is some images of demonstration in Brazil. This is called Altemer, that it's the culpes 
present. And also this is the police uh, in some demonstrations. This is, they are students running a route of bombs in Brazil. And I can't finish my speech without saying also that our former president, Lula da Silva, is now a political prisoner. He was arrested in a decision based on absolutely no evidence. He's innocent, and the only crime that he committed was to make a government for those people who had been historically forgotten, that took more than four million people out of streaming poverty, that put in the university a million students who had never dreamed of going to the college because of their social class and their race, that initiate a process of social transformation in Brazil. This year, we will have presidential elections in October, and the Brazilian elite doesn't want Lula to return to the presidency and to continue his project of building a more just and egalitarian Brazil. He is in first place in the electoral pools. He has doubled to the intention of the second place, and the people want him for what he did and for what he represents, the first worker president of Brazil, a metallurgist, a symbol that the poor people have the right to dream of a better life, to have a social rights and to have voice. That's why we are campaigning for Lula's freedom and his right to be a candidate. No? Wait. Just, just wait, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this, this image is for the Global Students' Voice. It's the seminar uh, that happens in Bergen, Norway, in 2016, uh, with students from all over the world. And our this meeting is to begin creation like a platform uh, to solidarity, to international student solidarity, and to sharing experience of our movement and strength our fight. Uh, and finally, on Thursday, Judith Butler said that those who are against the academy freedom and those who censor us are in fact people who are afraid, afraid of our potential to think and to transform. And after all this day here in this conference that I have participated in such interesting debates and to meet such brilliant people, I such like young people, women, blacks, indigenous people, LGBT people from all over the world, I can only say that they surely really be afraid because we uh, will continue the fight and transform the academy and our society into a more plural, democratic and free society. Thank you very much for all. Thank you so much, Tamiris. It's really interesting to listen to your experiences from Brazil. We'll move on to uh, Fasia Hassan to uh, share her story from South Africa. All right, minor technical difficulty. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Fasia Hassan, uh, as we've been introduced. Uh, I can't stand here in front of you without beginning uh, in a very South African way. So traditionally, uh, the way we begin such discussions, and I'm looking at Tavo because he's gonna have to help me out here. Um, but it's, it's, it's very customary for someone in a political space to get up uh, and chant Amandla, and then the crowd is our too basically meaning power to the people. And this was something that was used throughout the anti-apartheid struggle and is still being used uh, at the moment. So, Amandla! Amandla! Forward with the student movement, forward! So now we, we're in a more South African space and mood. Right, so like I said, my name is uh, Fasia Hassan. Uh, I'm a student activist. 
I'm also a so-called born free. I was born at the end of 1993, just three months shy of the very first democratic elections in my country. And unfortunately, the story isn't as good as I would like it to be, standing in front of you. We have a huge skill scarcity in the country. We have a plateaued economic growth, a lack of access to education and to resources, an incredibly high unemployment rate. Uh, the majority of my country is under the age of 30, and we have something like between 50 and 60% unemployment, particularly youth unemployment. Even if you study, it's going to be very, very, very difficult for you to get a job. And this is in the background of already recovering from hundreds of years of colonialism and decades more of apartheid. And so when myself and other students found themselves not just in the university space, but as student representatives, we were faced with exorbitant fee increments and a university space that was not conducive to the success of students. The current situation in South Africa is that higher education is severely commodified. You can be getting straight A's, you can be one of the top students, but if you don't have the money and you have outstanding fees, you're not going to get your results, you're going to get financially excluded, and you're not going to be able to come back. And so a number of us on the 14th of October 2015, we woke up very, very early in the morning, about 5, 6 o'clock, walked and got to our university, and we sat down. Except we sat down in front of the gates. And this was a radical but non-violent protest action in which we intended to show the university community, this was after the failed negotiations, that this potential increment would result in the closing of the doors of higher learning, particularly to the poor black child. And in South Africa, the discussion is still very racialized because access is inherently linked to race at the current space. Whether we like it or not, that is the situation. And so we woke up, we blocked the gates, we were called very wonderful names, savages, baboons, all the, all the wonderful ones. But within a few days, we had grown in number. We grew from about 20 people to several hundred to several thousand. And within three or four days, every single institution in the country, higher education institution, was shut down. And that was because of a lack of access to higher education. Now, very quickly, just so that you understand, I'm sure it will come up in the questions, but there's three ways in which you can fund higher education in South Africa. Number one is the state subsidy. Number two is sort of through donors and sponsors. And number three, of course, is fees. Now, state subsidy post-1994 has decreased in real terms from about 50% down to 38%. Not because government is putting in less money, but because we have more students in the system. And we have more students in the system because we opened up the doors. During apartheid, you couldn't just study as a person of color. You had to apply for ministerial permission to be given that chance to study. And so, of course, all of those barriers got lifted, but not enough money was being put into the system to match the number of students coming in. Can't always rely on donor funding. We all know this. It depends on the mood. It depends on who wants to do some corporate social investment. And so, of course, what happened was they increased fees. And the burden of funding higher education went on to students. And now people will say, what about scholarships? What about government funding? Government funding is not sufficient. On average, it's going to cost you about 100,000 rand. And we'll have to do the different uh, calculations on, on, on currencies. But it's going to cost you around 100,000 rand to study at a university in South Africa. And government funding stops at about 67 to 72,000 rand. And it doesn't take a math genius to tell you that there's, there's that gap. And like I said earlier, if you have fees outstanding, sorry for you, you're not going to continue, whether you have the capabilities of no, or not. So of course, this is what then led to, to, to the creation of uh, Fees Must Fall. And you can see some of the pictures which I'll go through, but um, I'll talk you through them as we go along. And I'll also then tie it into just a few key points. This is a student hiding under a bridge in the, just outside my university. During the protests in 2016, there was severe police brutality. 
shot, being, students being shot, tear gas, stun grenades, um, students being imprisoned. Even now, there's a student who's in prison for eight years uh, due to the Fismas Fall protests. And so I just wanted to, to give people an idea of what, what, what's really going on on the ground. So this is a student uh, hiding away, I guess. This is Wits University. And these on the, the side are Caspers, uh, basically armored vehicles of the police. This is my elbow. You can't see my elbow, but it's, it's there in the corner. Uh, and basically, we had sat down on the ground um, with our hands up. The difference was, though, is despite the fact that we had no weaponry and that we were not presenting an actual threat, the police still shot. And they still fired tear gas and they still fired stun grenades. We have students today who have been severely burnt. I'm talking, you know, facial scars because we were sitting on the ground and they just threw these stun grenades and we couldn't get up fa fast enough to run away. And that's the kind of physical scars that students have gone through in South Africa to, to, to really realize a different economic state for themselves. Uh, this is a student also at one of my universities. This is private security. He seems to be holding a stick of sorts and harassing one of my students. Uh, this is just some of the protests. As you can see, fees must fall. That's the name of the movement. Um, this is another one, uh, do only the rich deserve education? Free education, fees must fall. The reason why I put this picture in, it links to what one of the things I think is important to talk about as a woman leader in particular. Despite the fact that we had a very progressive movement, there was still a lot of patriarchy. So when we would go up to address thousands of students, you know, I'd go up, I'd, you know, mantla, we're too sure, I'll say what I need to say, and yeah, comrades were like, yes, yes, nice. Then one of the other male leaders, tall, broad-shouldered man, comes through. He says exactly what I said. Exactly. Yes, lead. Did you guys hear leadership? Yes. And me and other women leaders were like, what? Is, are, are, they, are you joking? We, we, we said the same thing. But this lack of respect and lack of believing that women should um, sort of identify uh, uh, in these spaces of leadership. And so what we did is, as women, we said, no, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work. We woke up, uh, we put on dukes, which was very symbolic of, um, of, of women and feminism in South Africa. And we, we went through and we said, women are going to occupy the space and we're going to be unapologetic about it. Uh, and we're actually going to continue, not just fighting for free education, but understanding that the fight for free education is an intersectional one as well. You know, about the layers of oppression. That while we fight issues of class and race, we also need to understand the oppression based on gender and on sex. Um, This is um, a picture, and I've put it in just to give you an idea of, of the number of students uh, that, that really got involved in, 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 in the space. This was the day we marched to the headquarters of the African National Congress, the ANC, basically the ruling party, uh, which was an interesting day for all of us, but um, it was important for young people in the country, and this is why I've raised this point, that students don't just have a role to play within universities. That we are there in many ways to hold up a mirror to society and to hold up a mirror to politicians and policymakers to say that the decisions they make, not just in education, but throughout the system, affects particularly young people. Because at the end of the day, we are the ones who inherited uh, this democracy. We are the ones who have to safeguard it and make sure that it actually works. And so this was the day in which we marched to the headquarters of, of, of um, the ANC. Education should not be a dead sentence. That's just a play on words of a student. Uh, this is another student. This is, I showed you this about the stun grenades. Um, people falling down, getting actually trampled on by police. Fees must fall reloaded. Asna Mali basically means no, I have no money. Um, so that was basically our hashtag and, and sort of the slogan line. Uh, this was just uh, comrades. Uh, we were marching through one of the university cities. Uh, as, as, as I suppose we normally do. This is the University of Cape Town. This is one of our mass meetings. So we would often stand on the stairs and students would just come through. So as you can see, it's very organic. It's very informal. It's very much a plenary session, but one in which not five people make the decision, but a few thousand. Uh, and as much as that sounds wonderful and democratic, there's a lot of logistical elements around it. And there was a huge issue around how do we make decisions in the student movement moving forward. So that's another discussion to have, hopefully, in another, in another platform. 
Uh, this one says, shoot down fees, not us, meaning students. Education is not a privilege. Uh, okay, this one, too rich for NASFIS, too poor for fees. NASFIS is the government funding I was alluding to earlier. Vits fees must fall, yeah, these are just pictures of us. All right, this is outside parliament. This day, there were about three or four students who were not just arrested, but went through court proceedings in which they were going to be charged with treason. The government reacted very, very badly to fees must fall and the fight for free education. It was viewed as an attempt at regime change. It was viewed as an attempt to hijack young people. Um, and of course, that's one of the reasons why we face such um, severe police brutality in the process. This was us, just us holding up our hands, showing that we have no weaponry. Again, students being attacked. Yeah, and that takes us through. But just before I, I, I close, I want to speak on the question of decolonization, which is not a discussion that's necessarily happening in these spaces, but is very much happening in a South African context. The acknowledgement that the university systems that we've inherited were never designed to educate us. They were designed to educate a small white minority. And we still have that structure in place. So there's a need not just to decolonize the curriculum and ensure that what students are learning is important and useful for our current economy, but also to say that students need to feel comfortable in the space. They cannot be studying in a colonial space. If a student comes from rural you know, parts of South Africa, when they get into a university, the fact that they walked into a university is an achievement. Basic education is another crisis in my country. Now they walk in, they're studying in English, which is a third or fourth language to them. Given the fact that there's not enough funding, there's a very good chance that student's not going to get accommodation because there's number one, not enough accommodation, and number two, they can't afford it. And so even now, as I speak to you, there are students who sleep in libraries, there are students who sleep in computer labs, and there are students who even sleep in bathrooms. And that is what young people in South Africa are willing to do. It should never be like this, but are willing to go through to ensure that they get an education. But it's the job of myself, of government, of policymakers, to make sure that no student ever has to sleep in a library, ever has to go through the, in, the, 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 the lack of dignity of sleeping in a bathroom. And so with that, um, I'll close, because I want to really have a, a, a lot of discussions. Um, but last, last point. On the 23rd of October 2015, the president of the country announced a moratorium on fee increments. He created a commission to basically investigate the feasibility of higher education. But very importantly, on the 16th of December last year, the president announced the realization and the rollout of free education for the poor and the working class, which is an incredible, incredible post-democratic victory for young people in South Africa. And even just two or three days ago, government announced some of the policy and how it's going to work. And so where we are now, we are in a space where young people had taken on a particular struggle, had continued through, didn't give up, and ensured that we provided the kind of constitutional rights that are there in theory and in writing, but are not actually being realized. And I suspect there's going to be a lot more to come from this generation of young people in South Africa. People who are continued to the fight, for the economic liberation of our people, but also to safeguarding this very hard fought for freedom and democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fasia. Then we'll move on to the next speaker, Mustafa, the floor is yours. Uh, so thanks a lot for everybody who has participated to give me this opportunity to talk today. <coughs> Uh, my name is Mustafa Said Hussein. Uh, I'm from Egypt, and uh, after the Arab Spring, I co-founded a student organization in my university, Alexandria University, uh, to defend the freedom of education. Uh, and that's why I ended up in jail after the military coup in uh, 2013. Uh, I was so lucky to receive uh, a very generous uh, scholarship from uh, Norway, which is student at risk, and I invite everybody to check it out and uh, read more about it. Uh, but I want to talk about the situation of, edu uh, of higher education in Egypt. And I know that it's really depressive and really hard uh, 
Most of you might heard about Giulio Rugini, the PhD student who were tortured to death while he was working in Egypt. And we have more than uh, 21 uh, documented kill of students in campus. We have very uh, foreigners uh, researcher facing a, a lot of barriers so that uh, the regime is trying to make the academic Egyptian community isolated from uh, the rest of the world. And we have hundreds of expelled uh, students in the country. Uh, the uh, all the student organizations were banned from the campus, like uh, Masr Qawiyah and uh, at the store party. But also, most importantly, uh, the government has changed the bylaws in the university so that they have canceled the National Student Union. And also, we have uh, a lot of stud uh, students who were elected in this National Student Union who will vote on the country terrorism list. Uh, but on the... Uh, and I think the students are now uh, standing alone, fighting for academic freedom in Egypt. And to be fair, they aren't actually alone. Like there is the rest of the NGOs who are trying to support them after the government cracked down against uh, NGOs. And also uh, we have programs like Student at Risk in Norway. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we have an academic com uh, community which is full of corruption. Uh, many, uh, many of those who we considered our, friend, our friends has turned their back towards us. Uh, for instance, uh, as my colleague Mohammed Abdel Salam has uh, said yesterday, one of the major uh, scholarship uh, in Europe has agreed to hand our government the short list of the accepted student uh, before uh, they got uh, accepted and they ha uh, the government have removed some uh, some student of it and some other countries in Europe uh, ask you to apply through the government not through them so that the government can exclude any student uh, who might be a security th threat um, and also we are facing uh, the highest percentage of people who can't read and write in uh, the Arab region, uh, uh, the highest number, not the percentage. Uh, and I think supporting student activists with empowering them with education is the most important thing that we can do now uh, to face what is happening in Egypt. Putting more pressure on the Egyptian government, or at least don't handle them our names before we got accepted will be so nice. And, <laughs> and finally, I want to end my speech with that. I know that the situation in Egypt might be becoming more and more boring and more and more depressive, but nobody has ever said, as, I, as far as I know, that our path to tomorrow that we dream of will be an easy path. Thanks a lot. Okay, so thank you so much for all of these presentation. And I think it becomes clear to all of us that student movements do still play an active role and are the ones who are standing up for injustice and demanding change for the society. And not only focusing on student movements, but reaching out to the wider society. Unfortunately, we see, and I think it's been evident from all of these three presentations as well, that the room for civil society is shrinking. And we see a lot of cases where student movements that are organized is being brutally repressed by the government, by police forces, or also by other groups. So I think it would be interesting to hear more from you. Um, firstly, how do you see the role of the student movement also tapping into the national context of your society, not only fighting for um, student welfare and higher education, but also uh, tapping into the broader political situation in your country. Yes. Anyone who volunteers to start? Um, so in South Africa, like I was saying, um, as much as we've been involved in higher education, what we've seen is the rebirth of young people. Um, and, and it's now spreading into the questions of land, of agriculture, of housing. Um, you know, we were also looking at 
to be honest, we're having a huge democratic crisis. We're dealing with it now. The former president of South Africa, uh, it's coming out more and more that there seems to be this element of state capture in which the president seems to have been influenced by a particular family who's very wealthy and influential. And it's coming out that essentially entire appointment of cabinet ministers, like serious things, nuclear deals, big, big deals, were really influenced by this particular family. And there's a role for young people to play in not just safeguarding this democracy that I keep saying, but also ensuring that we set an example of a group of young people who are willing to take responsibility, who are willing to put in the time, and who are willing to say, we're going to do what it takes to take South Africa to that next level. And I think we are starting to see that. Um, of course, it, Fees Must Fall started um, two years ago. It's, uh, we, yeah, it's just under two years. Um, so we are starting to see it go through, but uh, it, is very, it is very encouraging, I think. Okay, uh, so in Egypt uh, right now, uh, we are uh, governed by, governed by uh, a totally maniac president uh, who, uh, people who speak Arabic can understand uh, more why I like to call him like that. Anyway, uh, uh, he, 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 he is totally crazy like, he claims stuff like uh, uh, that he in uh, like uh, the army has invented this machine that can cure AIDS and uh, hepatitis C uh, stuff like that and uh, the student movement are just trying to earn a small margin uh, to fight this kind of craziness uh, to raise more awareness uh, and I think like right after the revolution uh, in 2011 we realized that the only way that we can continue our way is that everybody fight in his, uh, in his place. So students will fight in their universities so that they make their education good for the future. Uh, laborers will fight in their unions uh, so that the, uh, we have some social justice and uh, etc. And right now the crackdown is really bad and the situation is really depressive. But we can still see the students are trying to fight more and more and again and again. And each year, uh, the government thinks that the student has been all expelled, all the active student has been expelled. Like two years ago, the, uh, the government actually has organized uh, the National Student Union elections. And they, they made uh, huge rules to prevent any activist from running for this election. But at the other hand, they didn't win it. The student who followed the regime didn't will it, win it, and some independent student won it. Uh, so the government didn't recognize the National Student Union. The next year, they changed the law to cancel it at all. And we can see the students are still surviving somehow. Uh, in Brazil, also, we have like an increasing of the students' movement. And actually, uh, I think that uh, in the past years like young black women and LGBT peoples and indigenous people in Brazil also are coming more and more to the social movement not just the students movement but feminist movement black movement and because I think that young people students are seeing that it's it's in our hand actually build our future and build like a better society and with what's happening in Brazil with this repression and with the coup and with the this cuts of social rights there. I think that uh, the people, the working classes and the poor classes are like wakening and saying, no, we have to do something, we have to go into the streets, we have to uh, organize in social movements and in students' movements uh, to try and do something, to try and to build like a better society and to try and to um, achieve more social justice and more social rights. Thank you. Uh, and I think it's become quite clear as well that we do have common struggles and we do share a lot of the same visions when it comes to uh, values within higher education. I know speaking on my behalf, being a student uh, leader from Norway, uh, a lot of my fellow students, they take academic freedom and institutional autonomy for granted. And that is obviously not the case in uh, the presentations that we heard here from Brazil, Egypt, and South Africa. So I'm, just want to ask you, 
because we also spent uh, two days during this conference to have discussions uh, looking into how student movements can collaborate, what kind of opportunities and challenges is it that we're facing and how can we uh, contribute to a global student movement or to contribute to more international solidarity across borders. So uh, my question is, what do you think is um, relating to your context? What do you think is the role of international solidarity? And also, how do you relate to the values of academic freedom and institutional autonomy? Sorry for combining the two questions, but we are, time is moving just so fast, and I want to spend the last minutes opening up for the audience. But um, international solidarity and the values of higher education. Mustafa, please. Uh, I, I think that any brochure which is bought uh, to, uh, on the Egyptian government is very useful, especially from the international communities. Like we have seen, we have seen it in many cases before when the international uh, community bought some brochure. And, and when there is some solidarity from students all over the world or uh, labor union all over the world with a certain case, we see the government is taking like a, a little bit uh, positive response. And I think it's, it's, it's really useful and crucial that uh, we all uh, come together and uh, help each other because the situation isn't that different. For instance, I was like uh, discussing the idea of our closed campus culture in Egypt that all our campuses are uh, surrounded by walls. And I discovered that in South Africa, it's the same case. Uh, and I think we, we are facing the same issues and we are uh, str uh, making the same struggle. And uh, solidarity can, can build this kind of network uh, that helps us to fight together in the common issues uh, and also can affect directly the uh, situation uh, of students in Egypt. Um, about international solidarity, we are building this Global Students Fight Seminar, and I think that uh, this is very important because uh, we are facing like same pr problems in different countries, and we have different kind of ways to fight against these problems, and I think that uh, with this international solidarity, with this international exchange, we can learn uh, with our friends from another country, and we can be more like strength to, to fight in our country so uh, I think that this is very important and about academic values like academic freedom and etc like I said I think that it's important very important we we freeze that we don't have like a democracy an academic freedom in a society that it's racist that it's sexist so uh, I think that we need need always in every seminar and congress and in space that we discussed about university and about access to education uh, this kind of of oppression uh, we have to link uh, the fight for academic freedom and for democracy in the university for the fight against censor uh, with the fight against racism against sexism and against uh, violence of for poor people and etc uh, and I think that it's important because we academic space like the scholars are the people who build our our thought I think and I think that we we have to link like all these kind of fights in our society uh, just a quick one on the international solidarity question my presence here as a free South African is testament to the power of international solidarity. It was universities, student movements, academics, trade unions, I can go on and name so many different organizations in the international community who, when we were being suppressed, killed, massacred, they spoke for us and were able to put enough pressure on the South African apartheid regime that forced them into negotiations. So I, I cannot even, I can't emphasize the point and the need for international solidarity enough. So that's on the international solidarity one. But very quickly, universities are a microcosm of society. And hence, academic freedom is fundamental to the changing of society. 
Because if you can change and, 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 and really level the playing fields in a university as a starting point, you can then use those values and those lessons to really outroll it through, through, through other sectors of society. And that's how I view our role uh, in the higher education space, that it's not just about universities or curricula or the student movement, that we're setting a tone and an example for that to really ripple. There's like this ripple effect to move into greater society. Thank you. Okay, we just have a few minutes left, so I'll open up if there's anyone in the audience who wants to ask questions or have comments. Yes, and I'll give away um, one of the mics. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I really enjoyed uh, the, this panel, and um, I'm also very happy that you all basically addressed intersectionality here. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's very important, and it's usually a, a bit neglected, I think. And uh, my question goes a bit towards extending this idea of solidarity, because yes, there's solidarity, or I can perceive solidarity amongst um, activists and uh, also beyond borders, but how can we make sure that we also address, or let me put it this way, how can we make sure that we not only mobilize solidarity amongst ourselves, but also try to ask for this solidarity um, by addressing the powerful. So how do we address the white, male, you know, upper class people who still have power, I mean, not only in your countries, but also here in Germany? How do we make sure that they listen to us and they don't only perceive us as a, you know, as some sort of, yes, we support these, we clap for them, but you know, how many female professors do we have? How many female deans do we have, and not, not to mention the lower class people in upper positions. So how do we, how do, we do that? When we were faced um, as, as, as students in a situation where we had almost nothing, I mean, as a student, you, you don't have money, you don't have a degree yet, you don't have a title, you have almost no social capital. We had discussions on what do we have that they need and that was the academic program, right? The fact that they needed us, the country needs us to study, they need us to graduate. And so when we shut down the university, it was more about shutting down the academic program to remind people that universities exist not for management, not for, 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 for them to charge us exorbitant fees and on the 31st of March send us text messages every week reminding us we have outstanding fees. We all know we have outstanding fees. But to remind them that universities exist for students and for the development of young people. And then if you transfer that into greater society, the economy was built, particularly in South Africa, on the back of the marginalized and disenfranchised black majority. And so what we have was, was the labor force. What we have is the fact that they need us to go to work. And so one of the anti-apartheid tactics that was used very often, for example, was the bus boycott. People of color who were laborers just didn't get on the bus. And what they did is they crippled the economy in those few weeks because they need us to work. So it's not about saying, okay, yeah, we know you guys are in power, but don't forget they didn't get there just, right? It's built on a foundation and we are that foundation. And then to obviously say, You've got this foundation, how do you then creatively use it to ensure that you get to your goal? Rather than just sharing the problems that we have 
And uh, at the end of this conference, we all have our bags and go in our different countries and probably forget about what we're talking about. So I think my question is not only limited to the panel, but to everyone who's here. Thank you. Uh, very, very fast because we are running of time. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think even, even if it, like in the worst case scenario, even if everybody uh, went back home and didn't remember anything, uh, this network uh, of people who uh, in, got introduced to each other and know each other uh, will help. Uh, uh, I, uh, I know, uh, I know for sure because uh, I am right now planning, uh, planning something with uh, other students about uh, solidarity with uh, 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 some of my friends who are arrested in Egypt, uh, and we are con we gonna work on that uh, through the upcoming days. So, uh, like, th there is there is always uh, this chance to like. To expand your network, uh, and it will help. Uh, that's that's in the worst case scenario. <laughs> <laughs>